Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with Mr. Snyder. Today, we finally are done with the Revolutionary War, and we begin discussing our nation's future at that point. Learning targets today are to talk about why the Articles of Confederation were weak and they needed to be replaced. We'll talk about the compromises that were made during the creation of the Constitution and its ratification. And we'll discuss the actual principles expressed in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So after the Revolutionary War, each of the 13 states creates its own state constitution and what's called a Bill of Rights or a list of freedoms guaranteed by the government. The government can't take away freedom of the press, uh, freedom of religion, trial by jury, etc. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, only white male property owners can vote. Uh, blacks, women, and Native Americans are not allowed to vote. So it's only white males allowed in the political process in most instances. So the Articles of Confederation is our first constitution. And the point of the Articles of Confederation is that we don't want to give a lot of power to a national government. We just fought a bloody seven-year, six-year, seven-year, eight-year revolution to get out from under an, a powerful king, a tyrant. So why would we give power to another one? So a confederation is a group of states that give a little bit of power to the national government, but most power remains with the states. For example, the federal government can't tax citizens, and it has no say in the regulation of interstate commerce. And it's also structurally weak. So there's no head executive, there's no president. There's a head of the legislature, but there's no president. Uh, it's a one house legislature. Two thirds of the states need to vote yes to pass laws, and there's no system of federal courts either. So this is a very, very weak government. Uh, the if the word confederation sounds familiar. The Confederate States of America during the Civil War, uh, they were also a confederation because they did not like what the national government was doing. So most of the powers remained with the states in the Confederate States of America. Here are some other weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Congress cannot levy or collect taxes. Congress cannot regulate interstate trade. Each state has one vote in Congress, regardless of its population. Two thirds is required to pass laws. Articles can only be amended with all of the states. That's almost impossible. Today, the number is three fourths. Uh, there's no executive branch and no system of federal courts. So this is pretty a pretty bad uh, constitution, but the main victory that it claims is um, it mediates states' conflicts uh, to claiming western lands. And so it does the Northwest Territory. It makes the Northwest Territory, which makes up the state of Indiana, and the Northwest Ordinance creates rules for settling it. And so once a territory reaches 60,000 people living in it, it can write a constitution and apply for statehood. Also at this point, we don't have a strong military, so we can't defend the port of New Orleans, which the Spanish close. Uh, it's kind of a Spanish and American town there on the Mississippi River. Here is how the Northwest Territory was settled. You can see they draw out townships and range lines, and the townships are then uh, divided up into acres and half sections, quarter sections, eight sections, and you can see I've also put on the uh, townships of Allen County, Indiana. You can see Fort Wayne there in the middle, but we have about 19 uh, townships, and that is how it was settled. The township system is still around today. So finally, uh, Shays' Rebellion is the last straw, and it's called Shays' Rebellion because Daniel Shays leads it. There's an economic depression in the 1780s that causes farmers to lose lots of money at the expense of businessmen. They can't pay their mortgages, so they risk losing everything at this point. And Massachusetts begins seizing farms from delinquent farmers. Well, they don't think the system is fair, so Daniel Shays and his 
mob of thousands of people shut down the courts, preventing foreclosures. Uh, finally, the Massachusetts National Guard has to suppress the rebellion, but this highlights the weaknesses of the federal government, that we can't control our economy and we can't uh, even protect ourselves, pretty much. So something has to be done. And in 1787, the Constitutional Convention meets in Philadelphia. Each state is to each state sends a delegate to Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. And two basic plans are favored. Uh, the New Jersey plan is for small states. Basically, you can remember that because the small states like New Jersey favor the New Jersey plan. And basically, this would alter the article subtly and make it work. It would give Congress the right to tax, the right to regulate trade, the power um, of keeping a loose confederation of states. Larger states don't like that only each state only gets one vote. If they have a lot of people, they think they should have more say in national government. And so the Virginia plan, written by James Madison, is what large states favor. They basically want to throw out the articles and start over and create a stronger national government with a bicameral legislature where uh, representation is based on population. So for example, today California has 55 or 53 votes in the House and we have uh, nine as Indiana. So in summary, they would throw out the articles and create a stronger national government. The Great Compromise then happens, also known as the Connecticut Compromise. And so this creates a bicameral legislature or a two-house legislature where the Senate is where the states are equal. Everyone has two votes per state. The House of Representatives is based on population. So if you have more people, you have more say. The South at this point kind of says, well, what about slaves? They're people, kind of, don't they count towards our population? They want them to because they want more power in government. The North says, no way, you treat them like property. Why should we get, why should you be able to count them as people? And so they compromise and they come back to three fifths. So each slave counts as three fifths of a person towards the state's population. And this, uh, so five slaves equals three whites, in essence. This makes Northerners furious. So here is a uh, visual of the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan and then the parts of each plan that come to make up our Constitution and that is the way it is today. Now how are we going to ratify this? Like the seventh article of the Constitution gives the outline for ratification. Uh, we've got people who support the Constitution and people who say it shouldn't have even been written, opponents of the Constitution. Supporters are called Federalists. And the main Federalists were James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. And they write the Federalist Papers, which are 85 famous essays printed back then, explaining why the new government will work and how it won't abuse the power that it's given. The anti-federalists are the opponents of the Constitution. They think it gives the national government way too much power. The main people are Patrick Henry and Sam Adams. And in 1777, 1770, er, 1787, 1788, 11 of 13 states ratify the Constitution and it becomes law. And North Carolina, the final two, North Carolina and Rhode Island, ratify by May of 1790. But not without a compromise. The Bill of Rights is what makes the Constitution work. The Anti-Federalists demand that individual rights like freedom of religion and freedom of trial by, or the right to trial by jury get protected from government interference. So the Federalists promise to add this Bill of Rights and in 1789 they whittle it down to 10 amendments and the Federalists ratify it and the Constitution is enacted and individual states ratify the amendments in the Bill of Rights between 1789 and 1791, and it guarantees individual freedoms from government interference. And here's a look at the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, stuff like freedom of speech, right to bear arms, um, illegal search and seizure, uh, limitations on bail and cruel and unusual punishment, 
and just stuff like that is all in the Bill of Rights. And then finally, here are the principles given in the Constitution. Popular sovereignty, we talked about in class. It's in the Declaration. The people are the source of a government's power. The government gets its power from the consent of the governed. Limited government. The government only has the powers that the Constitution gives it. It doesn't have any more gov powers than that. That's why it's limited. Uh, John Locke's idea, separation of powers. The government is divided into the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches. Federalism is the idea that we have two governments. The federal government can do some things, the state governments can do some things, and then there's some things they can do together, like both of, us, both of them tax us. Uh, checks and balances, each branch of the government has power over the other two to make sure they don't get out of control. And we also have a representative government or a indirect democracy or a democratic republic, all the same thing. Citizens elect representatives to make laws in the government. And that is how our constitution came into being and what it looks like. Make sure you fill out those learning targets and I'll see you back here in class. Bye-bye.